NBA, the NHL, preseasons, season, playoffs, draft, and the camp. The NFL, preseason, season, playoffs, Super Bowl, draft, off-season workouts, camp. Baseball feeling the squeeze. In between two pushing walls. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to another edition of Park Ridge Sports History. This week, of course, is the Midsummer Classic, aka Baseball's All-Star Game, which always probably has the most thrills, chills, and spills of any of the All-Star competitions of the four major sports here in North America. Now, Maybe over the last, I would say, 20 years, it hasn't had the same appeal as it had prior to interleague play and uh, all things cable, all things, let's say, basically every team almost being uh, on TV almost every night. So there has been some of that appeal, that charm that mystique about players from other leagues that has been lost over the last 20, 25 years. But nevertheless, it always provides an entertaining, uh, an entertaining night, three plus hours of just seeing probably the game's best players uh, performing in a different ballpark every year. And I think that's what sets baseball kind of, actually it does. Baseball is set above all the other All-Star games because uh, the players are wearing either their distinctive road or distinctive home uniforms of the franchises that they represent. That's number one. It doesn't say NL All-Stars and AL All-Stars. No, it has their individual teams. Plus, every team should be represented. Now, a couple of times there hasn't been because of injury and all the rest of it. One year I do remember, 1971, I think Toby Harrow was supposed to be the representatives for the Texas Rangers, uh, or 1972, pardon me. Uh, Texas had moved during the winter of 71. And in 72, the Washington Senators, which were the new, the expansion Washington Senators, took flight and went to Arlington. And I believe that Toby Harrow was their lone representative, and he got hurt. And I remember that Earl Weaver replaced him with another Oriole. And as a kid, I always always got upset about that. But with baseball, all the teams are represented. And I think it's a good thing because the argument has always been, well, you know, this guy only has, let's say, five Ws for a last place team, or he's only hitting 280. He's got 27 RBIs. But uh, sometimes a player is performing at an all-star level with crummy teams, whereas another guy – maybe making the all-star team is benefiting the fact that he can't help but drive in runs if the bases are always full, or he can't help but win games uh, even if he gives up 10 runs and his team happens to score 11. I mean, there are situations like that. So I think it's good that all the teams are represented. And of course, they have expanded the roster uh, over the last few years. The other thing I think that makes baseball uh, really stand out is the fact that the voter uh, or voting for at least the starting eight for the uh, each team was brought back in 1970. So we've had 50 plus years of it. And for the most part, the fans do a pretty good job. What my argument has always been with the, the naysayers of the write-in or of the ballots by the fans is that really when you think about it, baseball, the fans are only choosing 16 players. The rest of the roster is filled out by either players, coaches, or managers, or administrators of the game. So in that sense, if it's 8 out of 25 that used to make the uh, the roster for each team, basically that's only 32% of the team that's comprised by the fans. And of course, there was a couple of times, well, it was stripped from the fans and way back in the 50s, the Cincinnati Reds fans were so enamored with their players and it was being played at Crosley Field that they decided they were going to stuff the ballot box. And then just recently, Kansas City did the same thing. So uh, baseball did the right thing. They kind of stepped in and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. we're going to start Stan Musial in 57. We're going to bring in Willie Mays 
and or Hank Aaron and all the rest of it. So fans do a good job. And even with the fans, and sometimes they might have controversial decisions uh, or, or, or votes, even the managers and the players are the same. And sometimes they may even be compromised because of maybe loyalty or because of, let's say, injuries, etc. And they have to pick maybe what is considered a lesser player. So the all-star game for baseball, it really is the best. Probably the worst is football because the players don't want to be there. Let's face it. It's one more game of potential injury. For the uh, Major League Baseball all-stars, with the exception of maybe a, a Ted Williams, of course, Ray Fossey, uh, a Dizzy Dean, I can't remember too many career threatening injuries that occurred on the field uh, for the All-Star. Uh, I, I'm just even thinking maybe 1980 with J.R. Richard, because remember, he does come down with, uh, I believe, a clot. But I don't know whether it was after 80 or 81. And he was really never the same pitcher. Now, I'm not uh, saying that it was pitching in the All-Star game. Maybe it was just uh, uh, by appearing in the All-Star game, it was just another uh, another game that was just heaped on a, a, a an injury that was just progressively getting worse and worse. So for the most part, the players uh, do a really good job. And I want to focus today on something unique that I, I did. Did some research. Took me, I'll be it, it took me a week to do this. And normally it takes me a few hours. I was enjoying it and stuff. Uh, I'm using Baseball Almanac and Baseball Reference in unison because uh, I found it, uh, they were two handy websites, two great instruments of research. And it's always a shout out for the both, but they really do some great, great jobs of getting all things. And the first thing I really wanted, well, I just want to go back to the cartoon. And here's here's my whole point. And I guess this was going to be my uh, editorial of the day. I actually wish Baseball would... Uh, change the date of their uh, Midsummer Classic, the All-Star Game. I would love to see them make it at the end of June. And there's a number of reasons why. We are seeing the game and the sport of baseball really not even slowly being encroached on by the other major sports. But I'm almost convinced that maybe what these other sports may do is just expand their playoffs and expand their seasons. Because right now we just ended the NHL uh, they played, quote unquote, an abbreviated season of, let's say, 70 games, but nonetheless started late, ended, of course, in July. But I'm almost convinced that the owners don't mind it at all. And I'm, I'm starting to feel the same way with the NBA, which is still laboring to get done. And they played, uh, you know, 10 fewer games during the regular season. And here they are. And it's the second week, full week in July. And they're not even done their playoffs. And just think about it. In another couple of weeks, they're probably going to have their draft. And maybe they're going to be happier having it uh, at the end of the season starting towards September than when they used to have it in June or late May. Well, it used to be way back uh, late May when I was a kid. So you're seeing that. Plus, football has become a three, you know, 24-7, 365 uh, corporate sports league. It really is corporate right now, more so than probably any of the other leagues in, in many respects. Yes, they all have their own uh, networks, but football, they've really, uh, really done a marvelous job when you think about it, making it into a year-round uh, sport. And of course, all the football fans just love it because it's more time that they can <laughs> research their fantasy football team and all the rest of it. But just take a look. And, and this is why I really want baseball to potentially move the game maybe to the end of June. First of all, it really should be baseball's midway point. But if you take a look at the number of games that teams are going to be playing by the time of the All-Star game, they're approaching more 100 games than uh, closer to being to the mid part of the season of 81. Having it at the end of June leaves all of July for pennant races. And of course, July 31st is the trade deadline. I think it gives teams uh, 
a full week because let's face it, the All Star Game is one full week now. Uh, they're off Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Many respects, uh, the teams start on Friday, so you're getting, so you're taking away a full week of July from regular season baseball and devoting it to the All Star Game, which really uh, the game doesn't matter. It really is a marketing. Uh, it's become a marketing product of baseball. Put it at the end of June, you know, right at what I always thought is they should have it as soon as the NBA season ends, the playoffs, because they used to end in June. Have it about June 25th. You have 80 games. Now you have another 80 games to play the season. And then you have a full six weeks before the July trade deadline. And really teams can, uh, over those next, let's say, 20 games, that's 100 games, really determine whether uh, they're in it. Or, you know what, let's just play for next year. Let's get rid of some of the dead wood on our bench. Let's get some young products in here. Let's uh, start anew for the next season. Meanwhile, the uh, the teams with the expanded wild card and all the rest of it, they can say, you know what, we've had another six weeks to take a look at this aging vet. Is he going to be operational for six weeks for the rest of the season? Uh, if we trade for him. What's he going to do? Can we land maybe even a blockbuster guy in his prime? You know, there's been talk in the papers about maybe moving Aaron Judge or the potential of moving a guy like Aaron Judge. Now, he is a potential free agent, but he is right now in the prime of his career. You know, I, I do sometimes wax poetic about Aaron Judge. I do like him a lot. <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not overboard with the uh, tributes uh, and praise that Yankee fans who are just uh, of, of an Aaron Judge mindset. But I realize the guy's a great athlete if he can stay on the field healthy. And he could probably help a team battling for a wild card spot or locking down home field advantage. I mean, imagine Judge playing for a team that's in uh, first place, maybe the White Sox. I, I'm, I'm just saying that the White Sox not necessarily aren't going to uh, play, but they need they need outfield help, and they are really on the cusp of maybe potentially doing something. Now the Yankees wouldn't trade them within the league or within the division, pardon me, but maybe moving them to the White Sox wouldn't be such a bad deal uh, for the White Sox. So all of this, it's it's a lot of uh, you know. Real fun stuff for the fans off the field as they watch the teams on the field. But really moving the All-Star game would really help the game. And then you would devote all of July before football sets in uh, it, and before maybe even the NBA and NHL decide, hey, you know what, maybe we are going to further encroach on baseball and we're going to go with our playoffs in July. We like what it did by keeping all of July to baseball and the, the reality of the pennant race, maybe you are at least locking one full month for baseball to somehow survive the uh, the onslaught of the other three leagues. So uh, that being said, I'd like to talk about today what I deem, uh, well, July 13th this year is the night of the All-Star Game. And I'm, this is where I started to do this. And there's two things I want to cover hopefully today. One is here was something I was amazed at. I was looking at July 13th and the All-Star Games, and then I was starting to think, how many guys appeared in one All-Star Game, and it happened to be their home park that they made their All-Star Game? And I kind of limited it this way. I just remember this. Bruce Bakke played for the 79 Mariners, and – when I went over, let's say, uh, the All-Star games, I, I noticed, I was like, wow, Bakke made, made the All-Star team uh, for the Mariners in 79. Now, this was before they really got good. You know, they got Griffey and, and, Ro and A-Rod and the whole nine, Randy Johnson's the whole nine yards with that uh, Seattle, pi uh, Seattle pilot. So, and that's going to come up, too. Really, I think that's where it came up. Uh, the Seattle Pilots. I'll talk about that in a second. Anyway, to make a long story short, Bruce Bakke in 1979 made the All-Star team. Now, that 79 game played on July 17th was played in the old Kingdome, which I always thought was clever because Seattle, of course, in King County, 
yada, yada. Although it was an ugly edifice. It had to be one of the worst places to watch a baseball guy. I couldn't stand it. It just always was hollow sounding, any of the games. I felt like it was in the, an airport terminal. Just, just, just a loud, noisy kind of plate. And it wasn't even good noise. It was just echoey. Anyway, Baki's first and only appearance was in the 79 All-Star game for the Seattle Mariners. And I was looking at his stats. He had a pretty good season that year. He does, and this was the other thing. Botke, along with only one other player, Don Mincher of the California Angels, are the only players to ever appear in one All-Star game that happened to be in their home park and get a hit in the game in their first at bat. Now, I know I'm really reducing it, really making it combination. But there were other players who appeared in one All-Star game or appeared in their first All-Star game. So I kind of limited it just to have some fun with this and to bring some players that we normally never talk about. These are footnote players. Some of you might remember them, the Don Minchers, the Bruce Bockies. But when I went through all the All-Star games, and here's another thing I noticed. I didn't realize this. The All-Star games way back in the 30s, uh, the American League – I believe, and I, w- I was looking at this. They actually had another exhibition that they would play later on against, like, the East-West. I have to check into that further, uh, but apparently what they probably did was they took the Eastern teams and they had an exhibition with the Western teams, etc. I'd love to look into that. I just didn't have time. But it is amazing how much you learn by just going back. And obviously, there's no such thing as a baseball expert. There's no expert. There are guys who know a lot because they do the research and I just enjoy doing the research. Do I know a lot? No, no, no. I'm not going to kid you. I don't know a lot. There are maybe certain periods of time that I do remember quite a bit of information on. So I am not a baseball expert. That's why I love doing this. I do uh, love doing it for all the sports. And this is what uh, happened. So I noticed that Baki got a base hit he had 16 homers that year, 100 RBIs. He actually had a good season for the Mariners that that season. He actually uh, and hit 316. But like I said, it was his only All Star game. He was age 28, and he was out of the league by 1986. Played with Oakland. Kind of interesting. Starts with California, heads to uh, Cleveland for a year. Kind of settles in and has his three best years with the Mariners. He actually told 40 homers. And over 220 RBIs for the Mariners for those three years, 1978, 79, and 80. And it wouldn't surprise a guy like Bill James because those were his 27, 28, and 29. James likes to talk about age 27 is usually having your best season. Well, for Bakke, it was actually age 28 when he made the All-Star team. He actually had 38 doubles, six triples, and 16 homers for the 100 RBIs, 316 batting average. And this is probably overlooked at the time. He drew 67 walks. So he had a 385 on base percentage for the Mariners in 1979, who absolutely stunk. Remember, they're only two years in. And for all those uh, uh, trivia guys, the first All Star in Mariner history was a guy by the name of Rupert Jones, right, who does play for the Yankees. I think for a season, maybe a season and a half. But Rupert Jones was another outfielder. Had some power. uh, Kind of like a castaway kind of a player. Maybe had he hooked on with a a team in the 80s that was uh, really into the pennant, he might have been a really uh, important component. I know the Yankees got him when they were kind of like in that realm of just getting any outfielder DH first baseman with power. Uh, They had that one... And everybody knows what I'm talking about. It seemed like every team uh, for a while there uh, with the Yankees were they were all outfielders, DHs, or first basemen. They could all hit, let's say, 25 home runs, drive in 80 RBIs, maybe hit 270, but they did nothing for the team as the Yankees just couldn't bond. You know, very similar in a lot of respect to what's going on with the Yankees today. They're not playing good defense. They don't run the bases particularly well. They need some pitching help. They got some mashers on the team, 
but the mashing is between a lot of French fries, if you know what I mean, <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of French fry at bats. <laughs> and that's where you have a very weak at bat, strikeouts galore and all the rest of it. So they do have some mashers on the team. Man, they got a lot of French fry at bats. Just a term I've come up with. Uh, interestingly enough, here is a picture of Baki and all the rest of it. If I can find it here real quick. But Baki and Mincher, and this was the guy who got me going on the whole thing. This is Joe Vosmick. He got me going on this whole thing. He played for Cleveland in 1935. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a baseball card of him. He had a monster year in 1935. He was age 25. Had an um, interesting career for the uh, Cleveland Indians. Ready for this? He, in 1935, he led the league in hits with 216. He did that on another occasion, 1938, with the Boston Red Sox. He had 201 hits to lead the league. Ready for this, though? He did some mashing that year. He had 47 doubles to lead the league, 20 triples to lead the league, 10 home runs, and 110 RBIs to go with 59 walks for a 348 batting average, and he had a 408 on-base percentage. The two great seasons in his career, he managed to finish in the MVP voting. The year I'm talking about, 35, he actually finished third in the MVP and, of course, made his only all-star vote. Uh, he finished behind Hank Greenberg. Kind of hard uh, to beat Greenberg because Greenberg, ready for this, 36, 168, 328. Vosmick, 10 homers, 110, and a 348 batting average. So Vosmick never made another all-star team, but he did make the all-star team in 35, and it was played in Cleveland. That kind of got me on a roll. How many other guys made their only all-star team and played in their home park, and then I said, and got a hit in the game? So Vosmick is the first who ever did that. It's the only all-star game he ever played in. Now, Don Mincher is an interesting guy, along with uh, Bruce Bakke. He did play in Seattle. He played there one year. And, of course, as I always like to say, Jim Bouton does bring him up a number of times in the book ball four. But technically, I know there are fans out there that are saying, well, wait a minute, Will. He doesn't uh, meet your criteria. Only one All-Star game in the team's home park, and he had to have a hit. Well, it's actually true. But I have an asterisk next to Don Mincher. And, of course, here he is in an Angel uniform. I think this is 1968, or I tried to. And this was 1967. All right. Don Mincher was a big lumbering first baseman, lefty, had some power. He had uh, five seasons where he hit 20 or more home runs. But here's the deal with him. In 1967, Mincher makes the all-star team, comes in off the bench. He was playing for the Cal Angels. That year it was in Anaheim. His first at bat gets a base hit off a future Hall of Famer by the name of Bob Gibson. And I did some all-star stats on him as well. But Mincher actually had, I think, two hits in that game. Or he was on base twice in that game. Pretty interesting. And um, let me just see. But anyway, Mincher is an interesting thing as I, I, as I look it up because here's the deal with Mincher. In 1967, he makes the All-Star team. He does play for his hometown, California Angels, uh, in his first, and I'm going to say, only appearance in an All-Star game. And why is that? Well, he is. Yes, he only got one hit. He got it off uh, Bob Gibson. In 1969, and this is the very first All-Star game I ever remember, and I know almost everything about it. In, 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 in retrospect, the game was supposed to be played on Tuesday night. We it had a uh, it was a monsoon, a real deluge of water down in our nation's capital. I remember 
waiting for the game. My brother says, now they're going to play it the next day. So Wednesday afternoon it was played. And I remember having uh, lettuce and tomato sandwiches with my brother Jim up in our room. And we had brought, we brought in a portable TV to watch the game. Well, the rain that occurred in Washington moved up the coast. Very similar to what happened last Friday. And it just rained all day long. And I can remember watching that game in particular. And remember Johnny Bench fell in love with Bench, fell in love with the Reds because my brother rooted for them. Uh, McCovey had two ba- two bombs in that game to win the MVP. Bench nearly had two, but Yaz robbed him on one play. And you can see that on a couple of YouTube highlights. But it was just a great game. I remember that Denny McLean, always being a character, was helicoptered into the game. He was going to miss it. I remember that in his place, Mel Stoudemire started the game for the American League. And Steve Carlton was the, uh, I believe, the winning pitcher for the National League in that game. But they really just overwhelmed them, 9-3. to three. But getting back to Mincher, he was actually the substitute selection for the Seattle Pilots because Mike Hegan was selected for that game and was injured and couldn't play. So they brought in Mincher. Now, I thought, uh, will only they can have one appearance. Well, here was the problem. Mincher never appeared in the game in 69. So I kind of like say this. All right, Baki remains the only one to get a hit in his first and only appearance in an all-star game in his home park. Mincher did it. He was actually the first to do it uh, with the California Angels. And what kind of keeps him on the list is the fact that, yes, he does make the team in 69, but doesn't play. So there it is. Now, I just want to tell you this. Mincher, of course, really does a nice – oh, by the way, Baki had his off Pasquale Perez. And I do believe Pasquale Perez, <laughs> what made him a lot of fun, I'm pretty sure it was he. He pitched for the Braves, and I remember he always got lost <laughs> going to Atlanta Fulton. County Stadium for games. I think the very first time he ever pitched for the Braves, he got lost. And I think they find him. He just kept going on the highway, getting lost uh, on the highway system in Atlanta. But I just remember he was kind of a character by himself, too. Now, there is one other guy I want to mention, and it's Ron Kittle. He is the third member, 1983, July 6th. And of course, he is had a base hit his first at bat. I think he goes one for two. The thing with uh, Ron Kittle is that this game played in Comiskey Park, new Comiskey Park, was played on July 6th. And anybody who remembered, uh, recalled the show last week, uh, remember I said that there was no ga- there were no games played on July 4th, 83, because it was the start of the All-Star break. It's kind of crazy. So, um Or there were, no, I'm sorry, maybe there were some games, but not all games, something crazy like that. Anyway, Ron Kittle appeared in that game, but it was also the first time that a Grand Slam was hit in All-Star history off uh, pitcher Atlee Hamaker, and the uh, batter was Fred Lynn. And, of course, the American League ends a long drought of losing to the National League because they had won in 71 on July 13, 71, Probably still one of the better games played along with uh, uh, in all-star history with the number of future Hall of Famers there. But uh, Lynn hits that grand slam, kind of overshadows everything. And the National League, their string of wins from 1971 to 83 is uh, ended on that night. Now, why I'm bringing up 1971 and uh, the all-star games? Oh, Here's another guy that appeared. And I'm just going to bring this up because I do want to bring this up. So those are the only three guys that ever had hits in their home park and never appeared in another all-star game. So you have Kittle, Botke, and, of course, Don Mincher. All got hits first at bats. I think Kittle goes one for two, Botke one for one, Mincher goes one for one. Uh, Mincher has hit has his off Bob Gibson. Kind of interesting. 
Baki has his off, I think, Gaylord Perry, because I brought up Gaylord Perry. Gaylord Perry was may have been a Hall of Famer. He may have been a two-time Cy Young winner. He may have thrown over 300 wins. He may have uh, won two Cy Youngs in, in each league. But when it came to the All-Star game, wow, he was brutal. He got beat up quite a bit in the All-Star game. In fact, I was looking at this. Even Jim Perry, in the one year that they both made it together, 1970, uh, they combined. Well, actually, I should say this. Gaylord Perry had seven innings of pitching in the All-Star, gave up 13 hits, six runs earned, uh, had six strikeouts and five walks. And the interesting thing is I do believe he starts one All-Star game, and I think it's the 74 he might have started and gave up two runs uh, uh, in two innings on three hits. Bob Gibson? Not bad. Ten innings. Gave up only three runs. So he had a 2-7 ERA. Plus he had a save. And I do believe this. I think Gibson only started one game as well. And the interesting thing with Gibson is that he has two nominations, but he didn't play in either game. Uh, he made the All-Star team. He made the All-Star team in 66 now, why I bring that up, 66, the All-Star game was played in St. Louis, and he didn't appear. And in 1968, he doesn't appear in the All-Star game. And, of course, that's, uh, you know, the pitcher's year. And, of course, Gibson has the lowest ERA that year. Baseball history, 1.12, wins 22 games. And he didn't appear in that All-Star game. Now, mind you, put it in context, I do believe that, uh, Gibson had pitched the Sunday in 1968, and his manager, Red Shanes, did not want to pitch him in uh, the Astrodome, even though he was warming up. If you ever see the uh, YouTube, uh, if you ever see the game on YouTube, he is warming up, I think, in the ninth inning. But the Mets uh, tandem of Seaver and Kuzman basically lock up that win for the uh, National League, which was one nothing scored. The only run scoring, oh, the only run scoring that game was by Willie Mays on a double play ball. And Killebrew, who was playing first base and was from the Twins, stretched and ripped his hamstring. So there was another injury I do have to mention. That's about four injuries that I do recall from the All-Star. And uh, he was out for the I, almost the rest of the year. So he did. I just remember the pictures of Killebrew just being stretched out. You can see that he made the huge stretch, got the double play, and then he's writhing in pain. Now, I do have to say this. There is uh, a fun thing that I came across, and it's this. There was a guy by the name of Hal Smith, and I'm sure my real baseball uh, experts from the 50s will know this. I never realized this. When I was looking this up, I said, oh, wow, Hal Smith played for the Cardinals before he played for the Pirates. Uh -uh, got it all wrong. Hal Smith. There were two Hal Smiths during the 50s and early 60s. <laughs> One for, played for the Cardinals and the other played for the Pirates. And the Hal Smith who played for the Cardinals made two all-star teams. And at, at, no, I'm sorry. He was named to uh, two years to the all-star. Actually had the chance to play in three All-Star games, but wound up only playing in one. He was on an All-Star team in 59, and they had two games that year. He missed or did not play in the first one. He played in the second, So, and he went 0 for 2 in L.A. Memorial Coliseum. And those are the only two All-Star games he played in. So I kind of want to mention him too. He's kind of out there too. I thought it was interesting. Plus what made it even more interesting was a guy by the name of Hal Smith. And I know all you Yankee fans know who Hal Smith is that I'm talking about. And this was Hal Smith of the Pirates who would go on. He started, I think, with Kansas City, played with Pittsburgh, wound up with Baltimore. And I think he does play with St. Louis. So you, you talk about it. Not only that, this is a picture of Hal Smith with the Cardinals. This is a picture of Hal Smith with the Pirates. This Hal Smith also plays is the Hal Smith who plays for the Reds. And they baseball even had 
Uh, I, I think this might be a card or maybe even a story on the two Hal Smiths who were catchers in the same league at the same time. And I'm telling you right now, you can't tell them apart. <laughs> I mean, this guy looks just like this guy. Uh, Hal Smith of the Pirates, the guy who hit the three-run bomb to beat, help beat the uh, Yankees in game seven at Forbes field. That was won by Maz's home run. And I want to get into that too. Um, but this Hal Smith had a little bit more of a bulbous nose. You can see it here. You can see it here, but they kind of look alike. I couldn't believe it. And then uh, here is Hal Smith again as a St. Louis Cardinal. And what's interesting, I have Bo Diaz because, like I said, I figured I might have a little fun with this. Bo Diaz's only all-star appearance comes with the Cleveland Indians in 1981 after baseball comes back from the, uh, the strike, 1981 strike, and they decide we're going to start it with the August, I think it was August 8th or August 10th, was an all-star game in Cleveland, and Bo Diaz – I believe was the starting catcher, never made the all-star team again, actually has a better season in 1982. He wound up with the, with the, uh, with the Phillies. I think he even played with the Phillies 83 pennant when uh, does play with the other uh, Ohio team, the Reds, but that is Bo Diaz. That's his only appearance uh, in an all-star game. He went 0 for 1, by the way, so he didn't get a hit. And that's why he doesn't meet the criteria of Kittle, Baki, and Mincher. Now, uh, as I'm paring this down, I just want to show you this. I should have done this, and here's the interesting thing. Then, as I was doing this research, I was like thinking, hey, how many times has there been only one representative from the team that is sponsoring or hosting uh, the All-Star Game? And it only kind of occurred to me later on in the research. I'll have to go back and take a look, but... I do have one guy uh, that I remember, and his name was Ken Brett. <laughs> now, here's the bonus question for all my baseball fans out here. These are all the teams. I shouldn't say that. He is missing a couple of teams here. The L.A. Dodgers, and uh, there's one other team that he played for. But uh, <laughs> these are all the baseball cards I could find of him, and he also played not just with the Pirates and the Red Sox and Milwaukee. He played with the Yankees. Oh, that was the other card I'm missing. Uh, he was traded probably in season. But here's the trivia question of the day. What team <laughs> did Ken Brett appear with in his lone All-Star uh, game? And he played 14 years. He played... For the Red Sox, four years. The Royals, two. Pirates, two. California Angels, two years. The White Sox, two years. Minnesota, a year. Philly, a year. The Dodgers, a year. The Yankees, a year. Milwaukee, a year. And when they say baseball reference says a year, he could have been there for, let's say, 60 games and then traded in the midseason. He actually had a lifetime uh, win-loss record, 83-85. and 85. But i got to be honest with you, the year that he pitched for the Pirates – he actually won 73 and 74. He won 26 games for them. He actually was 13 and 9 both years. And his ERA was half a point below league average. He actually had a 344 ERA and a 330 ERA. And then uh, in 75 with the Pirates, he was 9 and 5 with a 336 ERA. I got to be honest with you. Uh, I think he went along with the. Yankees for Willie Randolph, and they got back Doc Medich. I got to be honest with you, he's kind of guy, kind of reminds me of a combination of John Matlack and John Tudor. I don't know why he didn't kind of like stick around and win more or why the Pirates were so happy, not so happy, but they really got rid of him. And you can argue, well, they knew when to get rid of him, all right, because he never, he has one year where he goes six and four with the 77 White Sox. But as you can tell, he makes his one debut. He makes his only uh, appearance, uh, an all-star debut with the Pirates, and actually did very well. He actually had uh, two innings pitched, and not only that, he wins the game. 
he was 1-0 and in his All-Star. So I'm going to bring up his record to 84 and 85. It's too bad he didn't make it the following year because he could have won it again and then ended his career technically as a 500 pitcher. I just don't understand why uh, he's just one of those guys that I, I thought could have been a better pitcher. May Maybe it would have been better off uh, had he stayed with the Pirates. Maybe he gets a few more years of going 13. I'm telling you, 13 and 9 is not a bad record. It's a 591 winning percentage. Your four games, you know, if you're if if you have four guys in a rotation winning 13 games, you've got 52 wins. And if they only lose 52 and 36, right? That's 88 wins. All right. You're basically on the way, close to winning. 100 games, probably about 96 wins. So if you have four pitchers and give you go go 13 and nine with an ERA under 350, and I, I'm doing this in context of today, that's not bad. And and Brett for those two years was a serviceable pitcher. Love to know why the Pirates got rid of him that way. Maybe he had to be uh, as part of the Willie Randolph deal with the Yankees. Who knows? Um, can't really investigate that now. It's a good 40 years ago. Last thing I want to do, I want to talk about the All-Star games that were probably the two best that were played on uh, July 13th. One I've mentioned already, and that was the 71 game. In fact, I devoted the All-Star uh, game show last year to that 71 game when you had uh, Clemente, Aaron, Bench, Killebrew, Frank Robinson, all hitting home runs. I think it was either the top or second most rated um, or uh, second most, uh, the highest total of all-star and future Hall of Famers in that game. Oh, how can I forget Reggie Jackson's bomb in that game? But I'm going to go real quick to the 1954 World Series. It was hosted in Cleveland, hosted by Cleveland in Cleveland uh, Stadium, July 13th, 1954. I would love to see this game. There weren't too many future Hall of Famers. For the American League, you had uh, Mantle, Burra, and Ford, Larry Doby. Uh, for the National League, you do have Willie Mays. Yes, Willie Mays, but he was in. Uh, he was not a starter. Gil Hodges, not a Hall of Famer, but here were the Hall of Famers for the starters for the National League. Snyder, Musial, and Jackie Robinson and Roy Campanello, along with Robin Roberts, the starting pitcher. Ready for this, though? This game has six lead changes. Started off the American League going off 4 nothing, courtesy of a couple of home runs by Rosen and Larry Doby. Actually, Rosen had two bombs in that game. Then the National League in the top of the fourth score five times, so they're 5-4. The American League bottom of the fifth tie it at five. They both score two runs in the next frame. Uh, excuse me, yeah, in the bottom of the fourth, to make it 7-7 seven, seven after se uh, five innings. The American League pushes across a run in the sixth, take an 8-7 lead. In the top of the eighth, the National League goes back out in front, 9-8. And then in the bottom of the eighth, the American League uh, scores three times and seals the deal and wins the game, 11-9. And probably six lead changes in that game, two ties, just amazing. 31 hits in the game. And it was a game that was, ready for this, Klazuski had a home run. Gus Bell, both from Cincinnati. And the other home runs, this is a good This is a good trivia question too. The other home runs, Al Rosen had two. Larry, um, Ray Boone had one. And Larry Doby had the other. So you had four Ohio players come up with home runs in that game. The All-Star game, enjoy it. This Tuesday, this is Will O'Toole for Park Ridge Sports History. Shout out to my uh, Park Ridge uh, fans, and I'd like to thank you again for allowing me the privilege of coming into your home and talking all things sports. See you next week.